Hello, everybody. My name is Ricky LeBron, and we are about to go over lesson eight from the Bible study, The Indignation. And this one, the title is When God Removes My, it's like dot, dot, dot. Um, this is based on Nathan chapter one, verses 14 and 15. But of course, let us start off with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for what you've done, for blessing us, and allows me to come together. Now, please guide us through this prayer, the Lord. And through this Bible study, it just allows me to have that anointing, that feeling, you to be able to be here, the Lord teaching us, showing us how we need to live and be for you. Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So first off, question one says, what declaration was given to the Assyrian king? And I can read that. So what declaration was given? To the Assyrian king. And that's found in Nahum chapter 1 verse 14. That's Nahum chapter 1 verse 14. And it says. The Lord has issued an order concerning you. There will be no offspring to carry on your name. I will eliminate the carved idol and cast image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave. Or you are contemptible. Basically, the Lord was like, I will remove you. I don't have any offspring and all that that are false idols and worship. All that would be removed as well. So the Lord is like, I will completely set the demise of the Assyrian nation. Now, in question two, it says, God thoroughly punished the king of Assyria. It says, first was the declaration of no offspring to the king. But this isn't the only time God declared problems for a monarch's children to be killed. It said, read the following scriptures and explain the message given to Jeroboam and why. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. We don't have to read it all. From that, what response, what answer did you get in regards to um, what message was given to Jeroboam? And why was that message given to, to that particular king? This is actually the first king of the northern tribes of Israel. Um, you want to say? Go ahead. That his child would die when Jeroboam's wife returned to the city. And because Jeroboam created false gods, did not follow God's commands, tried to deceive God through disguising his wife as somebody else. Yep. Hey, yep, you're right. And that's interesting. I didn't even think about the fact that he tried to have his wife um be someone else. Like they like carry on this lie to be able to ask the Lord for something. And it kind of makes us realize that we really can't do that when we're trying to go to God for help for something. We can't go in there with a the lie and then be like, okay Lord, but I need your help on this other matter over here. Instead, we just have to come as we are truthfully speaking. But of course, also it does help for us to also, of course, believe. It is very interesting how Jeroboam turned to these false idols, but then of course realized that those things were false. They could not have been any help because when things really, when he really needed um, the Lord or someone to be able to help him in that situation, he now turns to the real God. And God away from his idols. But the Lord is like, no, no. I'm not exactly sure why my screen is all blue like that, but no. <laughs> and I up and I realized, like, why am I so blue? <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on with this camera, but that's okay. But he but but basically though, we also have to have that recognizing as, as well that we can't turn to ourselves, we can't turn to false idols, we can't turn to celebrities, we can't turn to any of that type of stuff. And then when something was really needed, now all of a sudden we want to turn to the Lord. Oftentimes, God is gracious enough to help us out anyway. But sometimes he's like, you have to live in the circumstances of what you made. So for all of us, we really do have to be careful in that situation. Now, in question three, said, why would God attack someone's family and their generations for terrible behavior? Um, I put for not following God's commandments 
and not doing right toward God um, and making genera generational stuff for others' mistakes. What was the last part about saying? Having generations suffer for others' mistake. Others' mistake. True. That's true. I um, I put. Okay, I put. Uh, humans are revengeful, and God, God knows all. So, you know, and so God, he knows, you know, what them other generations may or may not do. Hmm. That's a great point. And I put on here, um, it kind of makes the family people accountable for everything. As far as if I know that I want to go through something, if you mess up, then it makes me accountable for that. But I do like how you guys are talking about um, sometimes the generations, like the following generations, would be a problem. And oftentimes, even in Judges, we saw that where uh, the Lord would do, would say, you need to remove a particular group of people out from an area, or you need to do something of that nature. And then what would happen is they wouldn't, and those people now became a problem. A situation, an issue, and you're just like one of those. Like this is what the Lord said, you move them from somewhere because not that group that you just tried to push out, but the following groups would absolutely come after you. Um, it is just one of those things where it's like, yeah, Lord, you know, we have to make sure to be complete, but we also have to make sure that the Lord can see where it's like if you hang around or this person or this other situation, then they will then carry on to do the exact same thing as you did. He's like, I can't have that. Can't have that continued blight or sickness as we might see. Cause I know if we had cancer or sickness or something like that, um, they try to get everything. Sometimes they have to cut into healthy tissue even just to make sure that that doesn't continue to pop up spread. And they can of course continue to be, an issue, but I like that about how the generation sometimes will also continue in the ways of that other person. Now, question four says, when going through a terrible situation, it's easy to blame someone from our, for our problems. Judah could have blamed the Assyrian king for their plight, of course, as well as the northern tribes, and it would have made sense, but for them, it was all about the situation of being attacked more so than a particular person. So, in our case, instead of a specific person, place them with, it could be health issues, finance, family relationships, or spiritual failings. Whatever that issue might be, imagine the Lord promising to destroy the problem from your life and guarantee that it would not affect you for generations to come. How would the Lord removing the issue, whatever that might be, help your life? And what would you do for God when he eliminates the problem? Or problems for your life. So how would you feel? So oh, okay. Sorry about that. So the question is, so how would the Lord remove any issues help you? And of course, what would you also do for God once He does eliminate those problems from your life? You don't say you're um God eliminated the, eliminating the problem will bring extra peace to our home. Amen. Um, because as we know, even with the problem here, God is a uh, God of peace. Yes, he is. And he wants us to have a good heart and trust him no matter what we're going through. And then I, um, what would I do? Oh, man. Thanks. Are oh, you good? You good? I promise, okay, I promise God that no matter what, I would use my talent to praise and witness for Him. So even though everything is not great, I'm gonna still give God praise and you know write songs and you know witness for Him. Amen. Amen. And you got anything, Thomas? Yeah, I just put. I would just thank Him. 
not just for me, but for the generations to come. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Continuing that, um, continuing that going on. And for myself, I would, um, I would remove the issues, help my life. Well, it would, I put it on here, it would definitely give me more time to be able to do more what I could do for the Lord. Sometimes problems isn't just something in our head, but it is, it can be something that can be a barrier to us to have the time to be able to do something. If you're constantly worried or physically doing something to take care of that particular issue or problem. But of course, when the Lord eliminates that particular problem or that issue, I would have joy and also could be excited because now I could be like a living witness in the testimony to when you go through something, how God to bring you out. And now you're even better than what you were before. Now you can show other people that no matter what they're going through, depending upon, of course, that situation, anyone going through something similar can also overcome that situation as well. And you can now tell them from a life experience of, hey, listen, I was this, I had this person this, or I was in this particular situation. The Lord brought me through. This is some of the ups and downs, but look where I'm at now. Because a lot of people don't really hear that. I know oftentimes what we really hear uh, is someone would say, well, how did you make it through? And they'll say, well, I was down and out. I had some issues. I had problems. I prayed. And then it's almost like they were like cut to later. I'm healed and I'm doing better. So when we hear that, we're like, oh, so they were going through something. They pray, and then instantaneously something great happens. But they're not telling us that in the meantime, there was some years of them probably going up and down or some months or something like that, of going up and down, back and forth, trying to get themselves together with the Lord, trying to get themselves together, whatever issue they were trying to overcome, to then become the person that we see, whether they're a gospel artist, a preacher, whether it's someone that we might see on TV or on online, or speaker or anything of that nature. So it's just one of those type of situations where it's like, okay, Lord, let me just be honest and tell people, hey, this is what it took to get from here to here. So if anyone else goes through something similar, they too can say, hey, I remember that there was a process and I can also overcome that as well. So it's like, okay, that's really, really good. But I like what you guys were saying there because peace is huge. When you talked about peace, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who's doing very well uh, financially. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who's doing very well. Um, what we would think of in their life because they're successful. And then you can see sometimes on the news, a certain person or someone on there took their own life because of whatever reason. And we're completely surprised because we thought, wow, they had everything. They had fame, they had money, they, had, they were successful at their job, but they didn't have peace. So having all that other stuff didn't matter because they weren't at peace. Meanwhile, there's a lot of people who's going through, but they have peace because they have the Lord. And they know each and every day that they wake up, they feel great because they're like, hey, I know that I have God there with me. Allow me to be at peace. So I like y'all's answers. That was really good. Do you guys have anything else to say before we go to the next one? Okay. In question five, it says, Nahum also mentioned that God will supplant the belief of the king so there would be no doubt of who reigns supreme. So it talks about in our life, what would you want God to take over and reign supreme? And what we mean by this is like, like God removing idols or things we might put before him. The king's idols are obvious. Common. It's just, but in our case, it could be idols that we have while people in our lives are being selfish. So for, we don't actually have to get that personal. When writing the answer, you can write down something like, you know what, Lord, I'd like for you to remove this particular thing. But instead of using yourself, let's use in general, what are things that people could have removed or what could God remove or idols that people could remove from their life that could help us along our way? So in general, you don't have to put down exactly what you said for yourself unless you put something in general down. Um. I said, I want God to reign over my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, you know, we, we did a lesson on this. In order for God to remove my quick temperedness and lack of patience. Because a couple lessons ago, you know, just don't react 
so quick. You know, it, it just the story of Jesus on the cross, all that he went through when he could have just smited everybody. He, he, he went through it. People were talking about him during that he was hurt, beat up for us. You know, he didn't right. do nothing. He just held his peace. And so when I read this question, you know, Lord, help me be more patient and not quick tempered. Be more like you. That's good. You know, you brought up something that's really, really important. Um, has a mindset to be at peace and to be calm no matter what's going on. Because you, you're right. He took literally the most severe beatdowns you could ever take. He could only even survive because of his divine nature. Um, <laughs> I don't think the average person could really go through that kind of a beating and still live. They probably had a heart attack or something of that nature. Um, but you're right. He actually had the power to say in a word, I'll be gone. Or do he could say something flippant. And it could have just wiped out people. It could have just did something bad. But he chose not to. And over this weekend, um, this particular weekend, it was on the news how there's been several cases where people would answer their doors with guns. Like someone knocked on the door, um, and this guy answered the door and just shot a kid. And then there was another story of another person where these two girls was in the driveway. They thought they was at the right spot. They were at the wrong spot. We all know how sometimes direction things can tell you the wrong thing. They realized it was pulling out of the driveway and the person stepped out and shot them and killed the person. Um, the, police who, it, the police went to the wrong door and knocked. And they were like, is this the right one? Is this the wrong one? When the homeowner answered the door, they didn't like say hello who's there, they immediately opened the door, had a gun, and because the police just saw the gun, they answered the door with the gun raised out, because of that, the police just immediately had to respond, because it made them nervous, they were like, wow. And, and we're seeing people who have what they believe is power, so I'm just going to solve everything with violence. Whereas our example in Christ was, he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to solve everything with violence, with an immediate retribution. He was like, I'm going to be calm and go through this process that I know I have to go through to be able to help others. Now, don't get me wrong, there might be times where you do have to defend yourself. We can't be complete roadblocks. But there are other times where it's like, okay, Lord, let me not go to the extreme in trying to resolve an issue and or using what idols, what things I might have. Just to solve this issue that maybe a little bit of patience, maybe a, a brief conversation could solve something compared to immediately going from I'm calm to now I'm about to go to lethal. So it really has been really interesting. And it's making people, of course, nervous. Well, we have to really be careful if people are doing this kind of stuff. So it, it's really interesting. But I like what you what you brought up there as far as using Christ as an example. Do you they start by that time. Was it just kind of went off? Do you have anything to say? Oh uh, no, no. Okay. So the Lord promised to prepare the grave of the king, and said, "What problem, sin, or issue would you like to have buried, and why?" This is technically more of a personal question. So, in general, what could people have? That could be buried. That that would be great for God to to bury or to remove. And I can give a brief example. Um, like for example, any issues that could be plaguing your family, um, problems that could be going on in the household, uh, whatever they might be. Sometimes for the person, you want that to be removed so that way, if the family is doing better then you yourself might feel like you can do better as well. So that could be something. But what are some issues that you would like that people could have God remove or to bury? So we don't have to worry about that. Well, I just put um, the thought of hurting other people who have, have done wrongdoing upon you. Oh, 
I like that. Thank you. The salt of revenge. Yeah. Um, because that's a bad, bad, but you know, it's like one of those things where when you let that eat you up, it it only begets more violence than this, and it just escalates. So I like that. That's a good one. Do you have anything else to do? Um doubt, fear. Ooh. Because those things can keep us from um trusting God fully. Oh, that's great. Both of you guys show something very psychological. Uh, but I like that. I, 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 like, I like both of those. Revenge and then also doubt and fear. Because you're right, that does put that roadblock between us and the Lord. Where it's like, I want to trust you, Lord, but that, that keeps getting in the way. I like that. I like both of those. That thing of revenge and, of course, doubt and fear. Well, Question seven so due to the promise of the Syrian king, um, it says what would be the response of the Israelites. It's supposed to be what was the response of the Israelites. And this is found in Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. If one of you guys can just read that for me. What was the response of the Israelites due to the promise? That basically the promise of the downfall of the Assyrian king. You go here, can I? I ain't got, I ain't got yet. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. This publish peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly Amen. cut off. Amen. So there was a celebration uh, to receive that kind of news. And that goes right into question eight. What would be your response if God proclaimed great news like that for your life? That you no longer have to worry about you know, and that for the wicked one would never get marked through you, or whatever your issue is would never have to you would never have to deal with that. What would be your response or what is a person's response when they receive good news like that? I said um I will share my testimony with others in order to encourage them. And then I will sing praises so loud that they would hear me in space. And I would Amen. dance so hard that an earthquake will occur because I don't want the rocks to praise um, for me. Oh, that's really good. You should probably write that down just in case you need to do it on one of your songs. But I like that, though, as an example. <laughs> that's kind of something that David did, for real. I mean, we read some of his songs. That's how he kind of wrote some of his stuff. It was very poetic. I, you really capture like that, just in case you need to put that in something. I like that. That's really good. You, Thomas? Yeah, I just put, I would be happy and I would give God all the praises because with him all things are possible. You just got to believe in him. Yeah. And I put it I would be super excited. Probably finding ways to celebrate him. Um, and like you said, make sure people know that this Overcoming this situation was because of God. Like I would be like, this is this is the Lord, and giving Him the praise and 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 what's going on with that. So I would definitely just be super thrilled over something of that nature. But I really do like what you said, Esther. Definitely write that down, save it for me to do it one day. Um, but that was really good. <laughs> that was really good. I like that. Well, y'all, that is it for this particular lesson. Now we're going to finally get into Nahum chapter 2. Um, lesson 9 says when we all work together. Now we'll start moving a little bit faster through Nahum chapter 2 and 3. There's like bigger sections of it, but Nahum chapter 2. Is it a full chapter? No, 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 no. no. Chapter Okay, that's what I thought. So, Lesson nine, that'll be two weeks from now. Lesson nine, when we all work together. Let's close this out in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for what you've done. Setting in our lives for just being amazing and great. Now, dear Lord, please continue to bless us. Use us to the Lord and just allow your anointing to fall upon us. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to be able to come together, to be able to share, be able to teach one another, 
and also of course, be able to use this and spread this out to all those we come across. Now, for all those who are watching this, now, please also continue to bless them as well, Lord, and just allow your anointing and your love to fall upon the Lord and to remove any problem situation or anything that's a barrier to those people. So we can go about and do what we're talking about, celebrating you, representing you, and spreading out that joy to all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.